So we know that the increased prevalence of technology and AI um, may eliminate some of the historical jobs that, that um, people have been trained for and are used to. Uh, but the question is, whose job is it to train the younger generation for the job of the jobs of the future? And I know all of you are working at this from, from kind of different angles. So, Anne, I'm going to go to you first. Uh, who's, whose job is it to, to train uh, younger workers for, for the jobs of the future? Sure. I actually think it's a consortium of uh, different stakeholders. Uh, certainly, companies have a contributing um, say and, um, you know, perspective in the jobs of the future, but I do think it's a collaborative effort amongst all stakeholders to get the right combination right. Yeah. Oh. So um, I don't know that we know what the jobs of the future are, so I think it's probably less about necessarily training, helping people understand what the, quote, jobs are, and more around what the skills are that one's going to need to be able to use and adapt over time as work changes. Um, and I think, I do agree, it takes a village, it's a collective, and I think we need to be particularly conscious for um, folks who are in, in, coming up in the world in places where the, they have a paucity of things that they can see about what constitutes a work. And so um, I don't think we've really got good career navigation in our schools. I think we could be doing a much better job there. Um, and we have some assumptions about uh, how market labor attachment happens that I think is inaccurate. And so I think we need to really be rethinking how we can create exposure really early and in an ongoing way. Yeah. Brian? Well, since our members are CEOs and university presidents, we tend to think about two different groups. And the answer to your question is different, mm -hmm. potentially. Uh, the first group is, is younger people or working adults coming through higher ed. And it's really, uh, higher ed is struggling with this skills uh, question, uh, and it's something that we're, we're helping with. But there's also another group, and that is as important as new hires are to any employer, um, they have a tremendous challenge with incumbent employees and reskilling them in the same sort of digital fields uh, that we're working with higher ed to respond to. Yeah. And you talk to a lot of university administrators. What are some of the things that you think that they're missing in this, in this conversation about of training and skills? Well, the, the, the marketplace, if you will, is very bad at signaling where the jobs are and what the skills are. And so that's one of the roles that we play uh, using a variety of sources, but particularly Burning Glass Technologies does a lot of workforce analysis for us. We've looked, we've done it in cybersecurity, data science and analytics, AI, cloud, mobile, et cetera. Um, and it's just, it's a, a question of getting the employers together with the universities with the right market intelligence to accelerate higher ed's response. Uh, Sean, and, and uh, a lot of uh, training young people actually starts before college. Um, and I guess my question is, what are your organizations doing um, to kind of fill in those gaps, particularly for low income? Um, low-income people. Sure, I'll start. Um, so at Samsung, we've um, one example is a competition we started nine years ago called the Samsung Solve for Tomorrow competition. And this is a contest that invites um, schools, public schools from around the country with students grades 6 through 12 to answer a challenge, which is show how STEM can be applied to improve your local community. And we think um, our competition over the years as it's evolved has really been one of those entry ways to um, think about STEM in a different way. Think about subjects that are maybe analog textbooks, sometimes perceived as difficult, in a way that really um, appeals to a generation that is, um, you know, who feels it's their obligation to drive change in their community. So a company like ours can um, be in complement to the classroom by creating competitions that help them apply STEM in a way that they already want to. We're just giving them the tools and um, a prize along the way, it never hurts, but allows them to think of um, how these subjects can be applied in real applicable ways. So we work with young adults 18 to 24 who have a GED or a high school diploma but have yet to get into a career pathway job. And we work with about 250 primarily private sector Fortune 1000 companies to provide them access to uh, this entry level middle skill job ready talent who they might have overlooked for a variety of reasons. 
Um, the experience of that year up and into the game, as we like to say, is both a combination of technical skill training that's really driven by the market and by employers' needs. Obviously, a lot of the ones that you all are focusing on and we all know about now. Um, and and really the what we call the pro skills or professional skills, the soft and softer skills, which some people call the hard skills, um, and that are the really critical skills that are, as someone on the previous panel was talking about, are the really human skills that we're going to need to be great at. And so we've been able to open up for these companies a population of talent that they are, that are in their communities that they heretofore overlooked. Um, and um, there's a whole lot of effort that goes on there around really myth-busting around perceptions about what talent looks like, who, to, who is talented, and changes in companies of the practices that are essentially they've ingrained in the way they find talent that leaves a lot of people out. So for instance, there, uh, it, if, if you were to, in any job in your organization or company, have a four-year college degree as the prerequisite, which is pretty standard and ostensibly a proxy we've had for a long time for a certain skill set or a knowledge base or our experiential base, um, you, you automatically narrow your funnel and cut out over 80% of all African Americans and Latinos in this country. So that single act of assuming a four-year college degree is required, which now gets slapped on pretty much all jobs in many companies, by matter of fact, as a sorting mechanism. It has, is ba has a lot of baked-in bias in it in a whole host of ways. And so we're working to help companies really see what they're doing that's actually against what they're trying to do. You look like you had a thought there. <laughs> well, um, just to follow up on that, I think um, our emphasis is building pathways. Um, and the pathways, um, because both the companies invest in K-12 and the universities uh, have outreach programs and partnerships with community colleges, uh, our work creates, uh, reduces the friction, increases the pull. For example, in St. Louis with Washington University, St. Louis and Boeing, we've created a pathway from high school into St. Louis community college campuses and um, a bet approved uh, engineering tech programs into a joint engineering degree that's run by WashU and University of Missouri St. Louis. And Boeing has overlaid that. And those are ma ma majority minority campuses. Boeing has overlaid that with a joint engineering leadership development program that provides mentors and scholarships and internships, et cetera. I think it's making the pathways possible and creating the incentives for students to follow. That, that helps address some of these problems. Yeah. And audience, if you can start thinking of your questions, um, we'll have microphones, I believe, coming around. Um, but Shauna, I wanted to go back to you, because you've been working at Europe for about 10 years. Um, 11. <laughs> 11. Um, before that, you were at Harvard. But you've also worked um, as a waitress and as a janitor. Um, so can you kind of talk about what that experience um, in some of those lower paying jobs has kind of um, shaped for you in terms of, of a worldview in, in, in this question of Great question. In future work? Great question, Adam. Um, so, I mean, I'm very lucky. I was born on third base, um, and uh, and what I've been able to, what I had was access to opportunity. And I would say, in this country, talent is everywhere, and really equally distributed, and opportunity is not. And I had access to opportunity. And what I learned from doing all kinds of work, including the work I do now, is really there's dignity in work. Um, and it's upon us, I think, as a society, and certainly for those of us who are in the incredible position to be elites, to really be thinking about what it means to create space for um, everyone to have dignity in, by being able to work. And, and so multiple pathways, um, not necessarily alternative, which has a negative connotation, but really understanding that the kind of way in which a very linear pipeline that many of us personally have benefited from, although I'm actually not one of those people because I took a zigzag kind of route, um, where you go to high school, you go to school, you go to high school, you graduate, you go to a four-year college, you work during your summers to do all sorts of cool things, potentially really early on, you might have had a paper route or worked as a waitress or worked at McDonald's or whatever your first job was that was so important where you learned actually to be a nice person and to listen um, and to follow directions. Um, and then, and then you maybe went on to graduate school, and it, like, but that that path is not the path for most Americans. Um, under, uh, let me just ask a quick question for you all: How um, 
how much, what percentage of the population of Americans do you think finish a four-year college degree in four years? Okay, whoever said 10 is close, I think it's like eight. So the reality is we have created, and we're sitting here in Washington, D.C., so I'll say we, the elite in Washington, D.C., um, have essentially created a really powerful construct around higher education and around assumptions that's based on a handful of our experience and really hasn't worked for most of the population ever. Um, and so we've really got to think, rethink how we think about this stuff now. And I do think um, it's really important. I worked as a janitor in college. I worked as a resident assistant. Um, I worked as a waitress. And, um, you know, as I had a in the home I grew up in where we all had chores, um, I learned that everybody has to, it, you know, it takes a village, you gotta do it all. And so um, that means that when I walk into a place, like when I walked in this space today, um, the first person who greeted me was um, a young person who I'm assuming is volunteering to be here. That person is absolutely just as important as my incredibly esteemed colleague on the left. Or, <laughs> um, arguably, because this person helped me get in here. He didn't. So um, I, I wouldn't be sitting here if it weren't for them. <laughs> right. So we both know that it's really important that, like, everybody. So those, those are the sorts of things I think you learn. But I think uh, dignity and work are related. And if we could, I don't think most of us would disagree around that. And then the question is, how do we make sure everybody can have that? Yeah. Questions? We have one. Here. So, um, this is a very, very concentric conversation, and I wonder if um, uh, you have experiences or you, you look at other countries where it, it, the system is not so diversified, you know, that, that it doesn't vary from, that there's some uh, national um, uh, thrust toward looking at the future, you know, uh, places like, you know, Germany, Scandinavian countries. Is that something that, that you know, you and your um, uh, explorations look at? Because this is certainly not an American issue. Who, oh, who would you like to have answer that? Any of us? Yeah. We can I, all I can answer. Do, I, can take I can crack. take it too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, having spent 17 years of my life in the federal government, running a, a federal advisory committee on higher ed and student aid. Um, you know, yes, we have. And certainly some of, the, some of the projects we're working with with the Business Roundtable are companies like Siemens, you know, that have imported their uh, German apprenticeship model and now are kind of exporting it. To, they imported it to North Carolina, now to South Carolina, um, et cetera. I think the one... The, the, the one trend that I saw over my 17 years, both at the state level and at the federal level, and it's required for uh, a, a plan or a structure like Germany's to work, uh, the federal government and states have, have disinvested in higher education. Um, and so uh, when I helped design our strategy, I literally did it without government intervention. We literally put our universities together with our companies, and we innovated. And it didn't involve any government, uh, you know, support. So I th there are very good models out there, but I think the one caveat is it requires government funding. And uh, I am not optimistic about that. So, so I would just echo that uh, frame. We are actually a hack. We operate outside of the public funding system for workforce almost entirely. 50% of our revenue, or about 155 million this year, comes from employers who make a contribution to the organization of access to the talent. And then the other 50 comes from philanthropic resources. Um, and so we're operating outside the existing publicly funded by all of us workforce development system. Um, the other thing I would just say that differentiates one of the many choices we've made in the US over time that has gotten us where we are is um, we don't have any uh, market mechanism. We don't, on the supply intermediary side, in education secondary and post-secondary and workforce development or in youth development or any other wraparound services, assume that our customer is the employer. And we're not paid by the employer to deliver any outcomes like talent. That's not what that system is set up to do on the supply side. So there's a total disconnect in the marketplace between demand, jobs, and the talent. Um, and there's some really interesting public policy ideas about what we could do about that, which I'm happy to talk about. And if I could just add, um, you know, Samsung is a global company, and we work in um, 
a lot of different markets where STEM education has um, different priorities um, in the global in the conversation. I think um, being headquartered in South Korea, you know, um, it's a country where STEM education is really in the forefront, um, and we've seen and been able to learn and adapt some of those. Uh, pipeline and pathway um, insights into the work that we do in the U.S. And we know that, you know, as employers, there's a gap between the jobs that we need filled and the pipeline here in the U.S. So seeing an example like what uh, South Korea is doing and applying it to a in a relevant way to American students is really the insights, but the adapt the sort of quality of what we've been able to do with our program. So we are very much learning from other markets. Um, and other school systems and other ecosystems of what we can do as a company best for the students here. We could talk about this all day, but I'd like to, uh, if you could join me in thanking our panel um, for a fabulous discussion. <laughs> <laughs>